whoever is listening, guys, welcome back. This is the Man with the Plan podcast. Thank you once again for joining the program. Today, returning, returning guest for the show is a writer for the Boston Herald of the New England Patriots, Andrew Callahan. If you watched our podcast in February last year, Andrew joined the show to talk about how the Patriots progressed going into year two with Mac Jones. There was a lot of energy and excitement. And then this year, very strange roller coaster of events. Matt Patricia, Joe Judge. There's a lot that Andrew's going to break down for us. And I think we got to just start. Andrew, how are you doing, man? There's so much to talk about this year. Even when the Patriots don't make the playoffs, they feel they still feel like the forefront of every discussion just because of the nature of that franchise. Yeah, never boring up here in New England. Uh, as you mentioned, you know, haven't made the playoffs now two of the last three years, haven't won a playoff game in four, and yet they're still up there because of people like, obviously, Bill Belichick. You mentioned Mac Jones or just how unusual a year it was where even if we arrived at the place most of us on the outside expected, 9-8 and eight team, 8-9 eight and nine team, the way in which they arrived there was so strange and the coaching set up and everything that went into it and the turmoil that that happened that you never see from the Patriots, even in down seasons like this one. So they're trying to wipe the slate clean and throw off to a good start. But yeah, no question. It's been uh, unusual last 12 months. Yeah. I think you go into the season and we talked about it in February of last year where, okay, what do they need to do to help Mac Jones progression? Because he made the pro bowl last year. Everything appeared to be saying, Hey, this is the guy to take over for the next 10, 15 years. And then that feels like a, a, back, a step back. Every two steps forward, New England seemed to make. They wanted to take a complete leap backwards. And I think you detailed this very well in this recent article you posted out that completely blew up. I just want to congratulate you on that, on the absolute dysfunction of this season, hiring Matt Patricia, the inside just doubt. I have a quote here. I love Belichick, but quote, he effed us. Can you just kind of detail the process of this article? How long did it take to write something like this? Was the writing on the wall since May? And you th- you were thinking, okay, once this season is all said and done, I can chart the direction of where I want to write this because the, the, the piece is fascinating for anyone that hasn't taken a look at it. Well, thank you, <clears throat> thank you for the kind of words. And definitely was not planning this since May. I, I was open to a lot of possibilities, perhaps a 10 and 7 season, even 11 and 6, if everything really broke their way, saying, you know, everyone's getting on Joe Judge and Matt Patricia as we were skeptical May, June, July, August. But My line was, look, if it's going to go down like this, at least let them dig their own graves. Whereas if they surprise us, let's be there to congratulate them. So I was open to possibilities. Obviously, you know, you get into early December, the writing's really on the wall. Bad loss to Buffalo on a Thursday night. You know, you squeak by the Jets and the Colts with, I think, one or two offensive touchdowns and games that, you know, you really should have won handily. Um, And so for them, I think they knew it. And so in the process, really, from December onward was just trying to report behind the scenes get in touch with people i mean you you also don't start asking questions for a story like this to someone you don't know particularly well like these are built on relationships you build over the last you know four or five years in my case and i collaborated most importantly in this story with karen garigi and my, my beat partner at the herald who's been covering the team since 2007 so her relationships run deep her knowledge her understanding and you just kind of get conversations here and there, maybe in the locker room, uh, speaking over the phone, texting a little bit, and just to get a well-rounded picture. And the, the biggest thing I would say about a story like this also, besides the relationships and the dynamic, and most of the writing was done, you know, after the season, because again, we didn't, they could have made the playoffs if they have just won that last game, is you're excavating. Okay, I'm not here to create some sort of narrative. Like they go out there, they play the games on Sundays, and we get a scoreboard. And that tells us whether it was good or bad for the New England Patriots. And so when I have these conversations, I'm trying to figure out underneath what's there. I'm not trying to seek something out. I'm just dusting it off, digging it up. And this is this is what we dug up. Yeah, I think the crazy thing for me is that every there seem to be these ebbs and flows throughout the season. Because usually you can kind of associate a New England Patriots team. September, they usually aren't really one to start very fast they usually kind of figure things out and you see throughout week six and we saw this last year in mac jones rookie year they started two and four judon said we're not a two and four team we're going to kind of show that and then they go on this seven game winning streak that allows them to get in the playoffs they figured it out about then and it felt after the zappy situation in cleveland i thought okay maybe this team is starting to figure it out then mac jones comes back and there's this up and down almost not really a power struggle but it felt like the fan base was split evenly. Like, ooh, Zappi has really made this work. And then Mac Jones comes in. He throws a bad pick against Chicago. Zappi has two fantastic possessions and then it comes down to earth. And I think one of your uh, people in up in Boston, Tom Curran, said that there's no way Mac Jones gets moved this offseason. What was your kind of assessment with that? 
And do you think there's potentially a storyline going into the spring and the summer that maybe Zappi isn't so, so far off from Mac Jones in terms of potentially being the starting quarterback for this team? No, I'm closer in agreement with Tom than anything else. Like, I, I think, you know, we're here in mid-February. Super Bowl's been over for almost two weeks now. The Combine will start on Monday. Then we have free agency a couple weeks after that. Like, when you have these voids, specifically for sports media, we got to fill the time somehow. Like, Get Up is on every single morning at ESPN, right? I do a podcast still once a week. You know, local TV stations have to fill their airtime. So you start to ask these sort of questions, and maybe there's a nugget, or there's a whisper, or the team makes a phone call. Like, someone brought up the Patriots sniffing around Debo Samuel. Teams make calls all the time i'm not saying that a call was made about mac jones i just think when you look at the tape last season and the circumstances under which the bailey zappy thrived he played the lions he played the browns he came in after the packers okay and they were using uh, a lot of things they didn't do with mac jones putting him under center play action you know an average depth of target closer to the line of scrimmage meaning these are shorter safer throws and so it was really, I think, a byproduct of the, that environment that allowed Zappi to thrive. And he's a hardworking, smart kid, don't get me wrong. But when you look at him, like the biggest box in his favor that you could check off in terms of him versus Mac Jones, people want to have that conversation, is he's just not Mac, okay? It's not the arm, it's not the smarts, it's not the experience. So no, I don't think they're trading Mac this offseason. I think the conversation, though, that it merely exists, A, is what I just alluded to in terms of the media filling the void, but also... It didn't come out of nowhere, right? You mentioned the regression for Mac last season, the turmoil between him and Bill Belichick. I can tell you the relationship was not good towards the end of last season. And so just the fact that you're having the conversation is notable, but the conversation itself probably isn't worthy of much of our time. Yeah, do you think that I, I a big conversation, and most notably the Buffalo game, is when we started to see kind of the frustration of Mac is saying that the quick game sucks. We need to do this. We need to do that. Is that more of him just really taking it from the summer to the spring, kind of feeling like, hey, I feel like I, I can show you guys what I can do with the competent coaching staff, with Josh McDaniels, and you bring in Patricia. Did he kind of feel like it was, man, I, I feel like I'm doing so much? And was it more of like the, you mentioned the relationship between Belichick and Mac Jones? Could that be revived, in a sense, with a guy like Bill O'Brien coming in, being the middleman, and really wor- reworking this offense to more of Mac Jones' strengths rather than just – it felt like a really safe offense. I remember watching a compilation of his throws this season. And I, I this isn't sarcastic to anyone watching. I think half of them were at least short yard screens or at least five yards down the field. It was very much like a defensive coordinator was calling the game. Yeah, and that was the sense that even opposing coaches got, right? Vance Joseph, defensive coordinator for the Cardinals last year, coming up that Monday night game in Arizona. is like, yeah, it looks like a defensive guy is calling offense. And that was on the heels of that Buffalo game that you mentioned, where Mac explodes. You see it in primetime. Everyone's starting to get a glimpse into what's happening behind the scenes. And if someone told me about that game, is that they were just trying not to get blown out. It was embarrassing. It came after their worst week of practice. So, again, just like the conversations I have with people and the relationships and time that build up, you know, to, to write source stories and report like that, you know, those frustrations that come to light on the public side for players and coaches are also built up over time where Mac, I think if I had to guess without speaking to him directly about this gets frustrated in that he's in there 10, 12 hours a day, much like the coaches, but then it comes time to put the lights on and play the game. And he's got one hand tied behind his back because he's only being allowed to throw screens or slants or bubbles or whatever it might be. And he's not pushing the ball down the field against what's a slower, more vulnerable Bills defense, as we saw as the season went on after that, and including when they went to Buffalo. So I think that is what it's about. As far as Belichick, I think it will be very different because next season you'll have a head coach of the offense, which is really what you had in Josh McDaniel, who's obviously a head coach unto himself. Bill O'Brien, you run the offense, you run the meetings, you handle the quarterbacks. Belichick can let him do that, have his input, of course. But last year, Belichick was so invested in the offense with Matt Patricia, something that, as we learned, didn't fit his skill set, let alone Patricia and judges. And it just didn't work because these guys are defensive backgrounds, thinking about how to work around their defense. And it was too conservative. And so for a quarterback like Mac, who wants to go downfield, who wants to have some sort of freedom, it really didn't work out. I think it will be resolved with the presence of O'Brien, time, as we say, heals all wounds. And I think that includes the quarterback coach relationship in Foxborough. Yeah, because it felt like there were specific games throughout the season where the New England offense did decide to air it out, and you saw the best of Mac Jones. I think you removed the interceptions of Baltimore, some of the best throws of his career, utilizing that one-on-one matchup with Devontae Devontae Parker, whether it's the Minnesota game on Thanksgiving where Mac Jones is able to air it out. They have some of their best offensive performances. You wipe away a Hunter Henry touchdown that may or may not have been a catch. 
And then you have the end of the game, end of the season against Buffalo, where they do decide, hey, we're going to air it out. Once again, Devontae Parker, Kendrick Bourne, that utilization, he had some of his better games. And now that I bring it up, that Kendrick Bourne dynamic, what happened with that? Because it felt like Kendrick Bourne was the number one guy on this offense in 2021, almost to be non-existent in certain games. Was there a relationship that Patricia that kind of fell apart? I remember hearing a lot of terms like dog, he's in the doghouse early on in the season after a fight in training camp. What became of that relationship and how will 23 really be that turning point for him? And could we see a 21 season from Kendrick Bourne once again in that connection with Mac Jones? So the most important thing to remember about the Kendrick Bourne experience last year is that it starts with just a terrible, terrible training camp. You mentioned the fight joint practices they have him with Carolina. He was first or second into the fray. Big no-no for the Patriots. But aside from that, they left training camp going, he might be our fifth best wide receiver right now, just based on performance alone. You look at the number of catches he had in team drills, even just the targets, like the time the quarterback's looking at him, thinks he's open, is willing to throw the ball. It just didn't happen. Tyquan Thornton was ahead of him, a second round rookie, even though Kendrick Bourne was coming off of a career year. So that's the starting point. Tyquan Thornton breaks his collarbone. There were trade rumors at the time that that happened, which I believe in certain circumstances had Tyquan stayed healthy. The Patriots might have dealt Kendrick Bourne at that time. They look at a surplus of talent at the position. You know, he's got an affordable contract. They can get a good asset back. And obviously Thornton does break his collarbone. They need him. He sticks around. That's fine. It took them a little while to move past that. And I don't think Kendrick Bourne being late to a preseason game, which is what happened against Carolina after those joint practices he doesn't play, helped any of this, of course. It only gives the coaches more reason to keep him off the field. Once he was on there, though, like, he was okay. It wasn't the 2021 Kendrick Bourne we saw. A couple more drops, some penalties, just illegal formations being on the line or off the line at the wrong time. That's other stuff where you just don't have a margin for error. Like, he wasn't getting the benefit of the doubt. And any time that he, he erred, you know, they made him pay for it. So when he wasn't doing that, when he had mended those relationships and was kind of on his P's and Q's, he was productive enough, but it wasn't such that there was a separation from a Devontae Parker, you know, or certainly a Jacoby Myers, who was, again, their best receiver. I think there is still that version of Kendrick Bourne in there. I wouldn't be surprised if they traded him again, but he's still in a team-friendly contract. This might yet be another relationship where you go, Let's wash our hands of a disaster season. Yes, it might mostly be on coaching, but you can do your part to improve. You bring that to the table in 2023. We'll be better on our end. And let's try to get back to, you know, 55 catches, 800 yards, six touchdowns, whatever it was the last season. Yeah. So when I look at this team in 2022, I think the most fun part was watching that defense. And it felt like every single game they had an answer, whether it was Matthew Judon, whether it was the secondary, which I think we talked about in uh, last year, that being a point of concern. They, were able to create turnovers this year. Jack Jones ended up being a nice surprise. Marcus Jones on seemingly every facet of the, on the field was a nice surprise. Talk with defense and special teams, how this, those units really carry the weight throughout the season, making those touchdowns and making those big plays, really keeping this, the record afloat and kept the new England Patriots pretty much above water for a little bit. They were treading water until that Buffalo game. What can that defensive unit carry from this year? and said, hey, maybe next year it doesn't have to be all on us, and they can kind of make the best of both worlds and really challenge Buffalo for the AFC East. Yeah, I think if you're going to challenge Buffalo, you, you just have to fix the offense. I mean, there wasn't that much more for the defense to grow. I mean, it certainly wasn't like an elite dominant unit you saw from San Francisco at times in Philadelphia this past season, but it was in the kind of five to seven, eight range probably overall. Um, with that, I think you just saw, you know, you continue to accelerate the development of your own players. I mean, this you know, it was no accident that Kyle Duggar had his best season in year three. Josh Uche had his best season. You get someone like Jack Jones comes in as a rookie, plays well. You mentioned Marcus Jones. Like all of those things kind of coincided with the growth and development of the players. It's a function of coaching, commitment from the players individually. The good news is most of them return. But when you look at season to season defensive performance in the NFL, a lot of it is just predicated on how good were the offenses that you face. Like it's not very predictive or consistent year to year, whereas offense, you can go, OK, if you're running it back with Todd Brady, Peyton Manning, Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes, you're going to be pretty good. You can lock in the top 10 offense. So for them, continue development, retain those players. I think you'd like another corner because when you look at December 1st on for the Patriots, they pivoted to being one of the zone heaviest defenses in the entire league. There's nothing wrong with zone coverage. Most defenses in the league play more zone than they do man. I think you would just love to have the, the versatility to say, if, if it's better to play man this weekend, we want to have the horses to do it. So sign a corner like Jamel Dean for agency, maybe draft another one. 
I think you look to upgrade the speed of the second level. Juwan Bentley had his best season too. You talk about development. Jermaine Edmonds is out there from the Bills. So I think you just build on what you do last year, specifically with the young players, extend a Duggar if you can, maybe an Uche. And besides that, just kind of work around the edges while also solidifying that corner spot. Right, and moving into that free agency draft part, there are a lot of pieces where New England can fill the void. McCourty might be a spot to fill if he ends up deciding to retire. I think we'll find out that, correct me if I'm wrong, pretty soon, right? That's, yeah, he uh, said on uh, Chris Price's podcast, let me get this right, I think it was like the Patriots report. Um, but he, uh, he, yeah, it'll be early, early March, the next two weeks or so. Right, so they'll be able to basically figure, he wants to give them at least a little bit of notice saying, hey, this is going to be a spot you may or may not have to fill going into free agency. So looking at this top 100 class of free agents and looking forward to the NFL draft, do you have a specific wish list that you've built up? Or what New England say, hey, if they go and target these guys and can be able to sign them because they have more flexibility this year in the cap space, along with guys they want to keep in-house like a Jacoby Myers or Damian Harris, who, who needs to stay? Who potentially would you be okay with walking? And who could they potentially bring in on maybe a risk award type of deal or a big signing like they did in 2021 with guys like Henry Smith, who who's on your radar, who isn't on your radar, who should fans watch for come April in the draft? So starting in house at the free agents, when you know your top names are Devin McCourty, Jacoby Myers, and Jonathan Jones, I, I don't think there's anyone in that list or Damian Harrison there too that you can't live without. You know, if you lose all four of them that's a little bit of an issue. But Jonathan Jones is a corner going into his age 30 season. The Patriots typically don't retain them. We just saw this with Stephon Gilmore. A little more complicated than that, but you're past your physical prime at a position that relies a lot on just your physical ability. You know, McCourty, they're deep at safety. They can resign Jabril Peppers. Then you get Peppers, Adrian Phillips, Kyle Duggar back there. Um, Jacoby Myers, the best receiver in the market. He's in a case where I think he might get outpriced by someone like Houston or Atlanta or Chicago, teams with young quarterbacks that need a reliable slot receiver like Jacoby, who's very sure-handed, great locker room presence, and just might offer, because they have more cap space, two to three more million dollars per year, and the Patriots have to move on. But you'd still like to retain two or three of those names, or I would say one to two of those names. Moving outside, right tackle has to be addressed. I mean, this was just a black hole that they had in their offense the entire season, whether it was Isaiah Wynn, Yadi Kajust, or Connor McDermott, who started the last six games. They've already re-signed him, but that contract tells you that they see him as more of a swing tackle, and his tape would say the same thing. So Jawan Taylor out of Jacksonville, uh, young player, mid-20s, a little bit more of a run blocker than pass protector, talented enough. Um, you know, he, he's a guy you plug and play, starts, fills that hole, not an issue. Mike McGlinchey from the 49ers, same mold, 25, a little bit better as a run blocker than pass protector. He's coming along over there, former top 10 pick. You've got the talent with which to work with McGlinchey and kind of mold and probably develop a little bit more. Beyond that, I already mentioned some of the names. Jamel Dean from Tampa, I think would be a great addition at corner. Can play man coverage, 6'1", 205. He's physical. The, you know, the ball disruption and production isn't there. I think he only had two interceptions last year. But, you know, where he's a little bit grabbier down there in a more aggressive defense, he gets to be a little bit more disciplined. Like you saw them develop with Stephon Gilmore. Maybe he gets to another level. I like Tremaine Edmonds, Bill's linebacker. Uh, that's more of the wish list category than the need to have category. But if you add a right tackle in a corner, I think that would be a very successful free agency for the Patriots, who again have the money to spend and the, the urgency to do so. Yeah, I think that guy when you had Connor McDermott, no, like he played well in the, the, that kind of role. But if you can upgrade, you certainly need to address it. And protecting Mac Jones, there were points last season where the ball snapped and there are two guys flying out. I don't know if that was a, a scheme thing or a protection thing. I remember Miami. Week one, some guy just flies through. That should have been, I think, a red flag for everybody going, ooh, this may be uh, something to watch for. And he gets blasted in the end zone for a touchdown. So those definitely need to be addressed. Um, I think of Jordan Boyer is potentially something. I don't know if that'll be a fit necessarily, but he's someone that you could plug in and he could be successful. Or is that not something that may be realistic? Buffalo may try to retain that. No, sure. And I know Matt Bowen, former safety in the league, now currently a writer for ESPN, had that uh, as a projection. And Boyer's a guy who, like a Duggar or Phillips, can play in the box, can play man-to-man -man against tight ends and running backs. You don't really want him in single high all the time because he just lacks, you know, the sideline to sideline speed. And the Bills were, um, to steal an NBA term, you know, really taking a load management approach with him in practice last season. So he's got some wear and tear. But in terms of a versatile safety, who's got great instincts and is a smart player, like the Patriots want those in spades. And I think he would add to that. So, yeah, I think they would definitely take on a Jordan Poyer if the money's right. Yeah, absolutely. And that 
moving. If they could be able to fill those spots, right tackle corner, like you said, let's just put that hypothetical in place. It's the draft. Uh, what does New England need to do in that first round? Do you Could you see a scenario where if Belichick's not really in love with any of the prospects at 14, he does a very characteristic trade down to try to get more assets in the second, third round and get the guy that they probably want later in the first? And where would they? Where would you think they target based on the conversations you've potentially had? Yeah, for sure. So I I don't know too many specific names. I think staying at this position, you know, at the, at this point in the calendar, you rather go position, right? Like once free agency is addressed, let's say they sign two tackles, and you've got three starting caliber tackles between Trent Brown, Juwan Taylor, and find some sort of backup with Connor McDermott in there. Probably not going first round with an offensive tackle at that point. Um, maybe it's corner or if they sign Jamel Dean, you don't really need it because you just drafted two corners last year in Jack Jones and Marcus Jones. So I'd hold off on specific names at 14, but just to go back one second, receiver is something I haven't really addressed that I think obviously that they would like to add some more talent there pending whatever Jacoby Myers does. That will be a trade if they make some sort of big splash for DeAndre Hopkins, a Keenan Allen, a Jerry Judy, people who've thrown out T Higgins. I think that's a little bit uh, too far of a reach for them, but that's another possibility where, you know, running backs more or less set, depending on David Harris. The offensive line we talked about, tight end is set contractually with Henry and Johnny Smith. They might make a big trade for a receiver if they really want to change the complexion of this offense. As far as the draft goes, um, corner, receiver, offensive tackle, and tight end of the four positions. I would look for tight end is kind of sneaky because I just mentioned Hunter Henry's back. John Henry, uh, John Smith will be back because contractually you just can't really move off those guys or want to in Henry's case. But Henry's a free agent next offseason and when you look at you know what they could do to again change the complexion of this offense there are depending on who you talk to two to four guys in the first round for tight ends that are worthy of a pick in that area so you have someone who could impact your pass protection in a few snaps he could impact your run block like a michael mayer at a notre dame um and obviously make big catches on third down in the red zone as his big body target because you look at the last eight to ten super bowl participants even this year Travis Kelsey Dallas Goddard a couple of years ago Travis Kelsey and Gronk Gronk George Kittle or Kelsey and Kittle like tight ends are very important to kind of modern football as much as it's all spread offense so that's an area I think they could draft a year ahead of time but yeah of course they could also move back take a tight end from 14 to somewhere in the mid-20s pick up a player what they do at 14 I'll say this last thing will depend a lot on how many quarterbacks go ahead of them Patriots are not in the market. My understanding is I would be shocked that they are for a first round quarterback. So let's say four go ahead of them. Bryce Young, uh, Anthony Richardson, CJ Stroud, and Will Levis, let's just throw him in there. You know, they're going to have their pick of like probably the top nine to 10 players on their board left. So do you want to pass that up? Do you see a drop off as more of like 14, 15 players? So you jump back four or five spots and still get someone in that same tier. Only they can answer those questions. I don't think they can answer them yet. But the quarterback market, I think, will be the biggest hint as to whether they trade back or not from 14, depending on how many of these guys jump into the top 10 or top 12. Yeah, it's going to be interesting. I, I saw mock draft yesterday with Anthony Richardson going number one. And so we'll see if that's uh, going to happen or not. But I, I want to quickly jump on a couple more questions before we wrap up, just for quick, just for my kind of sake in the audiences. You mentioned John U. Smith and Hunter Henry were both on contract. And I think for Hunter Henry, it's relatively gone well. In his tenure with the Patriots, he had a great season last year, kind of had a regression that may or may not be a scheme thing or offense. John U. Smith, it's been a complete disaster in terms of his production. He hasn't been what the Patriots had hoped for in, ter in terms of his athleticism, utilizing all that. He's had a couple big plays here and there where you see the sparks of what they really wanted. I, I remember a Cleveland game, a couple catching off the screen. Uh, I think it gets uh, might have been the Colts, but I'm not sure. But what can O'Brien do and come in and say, hey, we have these two tight end sets. He was an offensive coordinator with Hernandez and Gronkowski. Could we see something like that potentially being brought back to the forefront and really utilizing and making this these dollars really be earned for these tight ends? Uh, if they do go back to more 12 personnel, which is the two tight end sets that you mentioned, it won't be with these two players. Like I just, they, they've tried to do it the last two seasons. John o. Smith hasn't even cleared 300 yards yet in a single season as a Patriot. He never cleared 500 yards in a single season in Tennessee. So I just think they overpaid for him that given the history that they had had at that position in 2019 and 2020, they were desperate for any sort of tight end who could provide, you know, introduce some sort of dynamism to their offense, break tackles like John who had done a lot in Tennessee, these run after catch plays. But ultimately, 
when you look at the numbers from those 12 personnel sets, you know, either last season or in 2021, you know, they, they ran the ball worse from those sets. They passed the ball less efficiently from those sets. So there's really no reason based on the production and the tape so far to say, yeah, let's run it back with these two guys. Maybe it is a first round tight end or someone early in the second round, like a Luke Musgrave is a guy who crushed it at the senior bowl, which the Patriots love, you know, only played two games at Oregon state actually has a lacrosse background. So, you know, that's extra points for Belichick and the Patriots, but physically, you know, you might be able to tap into something like you had with Gronk. And I'm not saying he's going to be Gronk, probably the greatest tight end of all time, but as someone who could be a day one impact player and better than 294 yards or whatever you've been getting out of John o. Smith. So no, I don't think there's a whole lot there. The thing that I've been pitching related to John o. this offseason has just been a trade. Take his contract, which is scheduled to be a $17.1 million cap hit, attach a draft pick, ask Houston, Atlanta, Chicago. We'll give you the pick. Just take the contract off our hands. You don't see that a whole lot in the NFL. You haven't seen it in five, six years, but for a team that if they want to create cap space, could do this after June 1st with very little penalty. Yeah, I think that it, you just kind of mark it up as, hey, we uh, we whiffed on this one and uh, and just roll with Hunter Henry, which may actually result in a positive. He gets more targets. He's able to kind of thrive as the sole tight end in that room. Um, and we'll just kind of see where that goes. The last question, you mentioned DeAndre Hopkins as potentially a trade. That's been, especially because up at Clemson, he's always in the conversation uh, in terms of where he's at in the NFL. Could that relationship work with Bill O'Brien and DeAndre Hopkins, given that O'Brien's been hired, that relationship famously deteriorated, which resulted in him getting traded to the Cardinals famously for nothing, as uh, many could say. Can that relationship work and be revived, especially Belichick, who it appears he and Hopkins have a pretty solid relationship given the Hard Knocks tape. Is there more to that, or would you be more surprised, would you be more shocked to see Hopkins go to New England as opposed to a Judy a Keenan Allen, or maybe even a T Higgins, like you alluded to. So I would say a couple of things first, if it gets to the point where the only obstacle in the way of, you know, Jander Hopkins coming to new England is his past with Bill O'Brien. I think they get across the goal line and it happens. Like, I don't think that's going to be a cheap obstacle. I say this admittedly as someone who was not in Houston during that time when Hopkins got traded, Hopkins leaves says he has no ill will toward Bill O'Brien, but also said there was no relationship. And clearly Bill O'Brien rubbed not only DeAndre Hopkins the wrong way, but players like J.J. Watt and other leaders inside that locker room. Uh, how much has he changed if it all lasts two, three years? I don't know. But the bigger obstacle for the Patriots is going to be taking on his 19 something million dollar uh, salary um, this season. It declines in 2024. They have to determine whether, you know, would we rather give up assets, then pay that amount of money? for that quality of player, is he still an all pro pro bowl caliber talent? You'd probably say yes, but they're going to look at the tape or would we rather just pay $14 million, not give up any draft assets and resign Jacoby Myers. It might not be that simple. Maybe Jacoby gets offered 16, $17 million on the market. I don't know, but that's the kind of math and decision-making that needs to happen first. Then you need to make sure your top offer, you know, is better than any top offer from any other teams. And you look at teams like the Giants, who have more cap space and better draft assets than you do, and that might be, or at least a comparable draft assets, I should say, that that might be a problem for them, where they go, we're a one away from really getting this thing together and going. So there are a lot of things that need to happen. It's a, it's a worthy talking point, I think. But ultimately, you know, these are two professionals. Belichick could say, you'll deal mostly with me. If you have any issues, come to me. We want you here. They need you. And that's his leverage is... You haven't had a one, number one receiver since, you know, you could argue Julian Elwin, but even going before that, you know, like he, he would come in, be respected, wanted. And I think um, that that would play here in a place where, again, they haven't won a playoff game in four years. Yeah, it would certainly be interesting. It'll be a lot to talk about as the uh, season or the off season rather progresses. And with that, I want to thank you, Andrew, for uh, coming on the podcast today to talk the, uh, the New England Patriots. A lot of great insight, guys. I'm going to link the article uh, from his story earlier in the off season and a bunch of other things. Guys, thank you, as always, for watching, and thank you for 17,000 listeners across all platforms. The show has really grown, and I'm incredibly thankful for that. If you want more things like interviews with Andrew, among other players, like Bo Collins, Bear Carter, Marcus Tate, or Ricky Sapp, be sure to subscribe for more stuff. Guys, thank you, as always. Take care, and have a great day.